everybody okay? Thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk today about radio phenomenon and neural ulcers. So first I'm going to go through some definitions and then I'm try to describe to you the pathophysiology and why patients with systemic sclerosis do get bad radio and digital ulcers. Then I'll talk about some current management strategies and then finally end with um, a slide just describing some of the potential novel therapies that are in development. <coughs> so first of all, what is radio phenomenon? So this is really defined by the episodic spasm of the blood vessels and it leads to color changes in the fingers due to decreased blood flow. So it can affect any distal area of the body, so it can affect the fingers, the toes, sometimes the ears, and even the nose. And classically, you should have typical color changes with uh, white coloration or discoloration when there's decreased blood flow, blue when there's complete lack of blood flow, and then red with green warming. Um, associated symptoms are going to be numbness or tingling and pain in those areas. So you can see this is a picture of a, a patient with brain phenomenon. And there's usually a uh, pretty noted demarcation between normal color and uh, the color changes that you're seeing. So this is a study to try and um, diagnose, give a, a true definition and diagnosis to the brain phenomenon. So um, it's a three-step question. We first ask a patient whether they have unusually cold uh, fingers that are sensitive to cold. And if yes, then proceed to the second step, asking whether or not there are at least two different color changes um, in these episodes um, of vasospasm. White and blue are the typical colors. <coughs> and if the uh, answer is yes, then we proceed on to the third question. Um, and you have to have at least three points out of uh, the third box there. So episodes can be triggered by things other than cold. Stress is one of the big triggers. Um, episodes involve both hands, even if it doesn't happen at the same time or it's asymmetric. Um, episodes are accompanied by other symptoms like numbness or tingling. And the observed color changes are often characterized by well-demarcated location. Um, patient can provide photographs to, to um, show an episode because sometimes you don't have an episode in the clinic visit. Um, and other areas of the body can be affected as I mentioned. And then finally having all three colors and triphasic color changes um, can also be a point. So these are all the things that you should consider when you're trying to say, do I have a or not? I think it's sometimes very difficult because a lot of us suffer from whole fingers. But this is uh, some of the things that you can ask yourself when you're trying to figure out if you truly do have a So radios can come in a couple of flavors. Um, primary radios is actually really common. It's not associated with an underlying disease. Symptoms are typically pretty mild. And risk factors include living in the whole place in Chicago, um, being female, smoking definitely increases your risk, and having a family history of radios. Secondary nodes is associated with an underlying disease, such as scleroderma. And usually symptoms are more severe and related to not just vasospasm of blood vessels, but actually damaged blood vessels as well. So if you go to a scleroderma clinic, um, you're also likely going to have um, a physician take a look at your male whole capillaries. So we use this instrument in our uh, clinic called the Dermal Link. It's a handheld microscope. Um, but basically, we're trying to look at the capillaries right here, um, just what we call proximal to the male fold. <coughs> so, male fold capillaries can be really helpful in the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis or scleroderma um, and related diseases. And we see some changes that I'll show you in, in the upcoming slides. Um, changes in the capillaries, including giant or large capillaries. We see um, uh, hemorrhages in the capillaries, loss of capillaries, and then we see disorganized capillaries as well. And there was one study that looked at patients who had Raynaud's phenomenon and these male capillary changes and were followed over the next six and a half years. And 82% of those patients did go on to develop full blown connective tissue disease. So this male capillary is really helpful in monitoring patients with Raynaud's phenomenon 
who are at high risk for developing um, scleroderma or related disease. So I also did want to point out that both random phenomena and the abnormal mammal capillaries are now considered part of the classification criteria for systemic sclerosis. So again, very important uh, to look at the animal capillaries when we're trying to diagnose scleroderma. <laughs> So um, there have been different stages that have been described in the animal catheteroscopy. It's thought that early on there are just a few enlarged catheters and a few capillary hemorrhages, and then we move on to a more active stage as um, the disease progresses with more frequent enlarged catheters and hemorrhages, and then some loss of catheters and a little bit of disorganization. And finally, in the late stage, you uh, actually get fewer giant catheters, but they become very um, disorganized, and there's a severe loss of catheters. So let me show you what this looks like under the microscope. So this is what a normal mammal catheteroscopy looks like. You can see all the catheters are very regular and lined up. And this is an early phase. So you start seeing some enlargement of capillaries, and you also start seeing some capillary hemorrhage. Then when you move on to the active phase, you see some giant capillaries and even more enlarged capillaries. You start seeing some loss of capillaries and more um, capillary hemorrhages as well. Then finally, late in disease, you're seeing large areas that are avascular or, or loss of capillaries. And you see these bushy, really disorganized capillaries. So, all of that goes to say that patients with random phenomenon um, and scleroderma have abnormal blood vessels in their digits. And this puts them at risk for another complication, um, which you are well aware of, digital ulcers. So these happen in about half of patients with either limited or diffuse skin tightening. And they can occur on the fingers and the tips or overlying the joints. They're very painful and they heal very slowly. They can also cause a lot of complications, so definitely um, causes um, problems with using your fingers or hands, hand immobility, um, can lead to scarring and loss of your uh, distal tip of your fingers. Um, you can get super infection, which can even affect the bone and lead to osteomyelitis. And then um, in very severe cases, the end of the can actually die. So I did want to define what a digital ulcer is and clarify that um, not everything on the fingertips um, is actually a digital ulcer. So by definition, there has to be a denuded area. So you have to actually use the epithelial level layer of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis, which are the two top layers of the skin. It can be covered by crust, but there has to be some um, opening of the skin to um, at the level of the digital ulcer. So you want to um, differentiate this from a fissure, which, which can be like a crack in the fingertip um, from very dry skin. Um, Paradigma, which is shown here, um, which can be related to an infection of the nail bed and inflammation around the nail. And then ulcers that extrude calcium are not really thought to be digital ulcers, but um, digital ischemic ulcers, but more um, related to the calcium coming to the surface and extruding. So this is what a classic uh, couple of digital ulcers looks like. So you can see it opens the air, and uh, you lose the, the first couple of layers of the skin. These are extremely and then here's just a picture showing that it can be covered with crust, but you can see that there is an area underneath that has lost the, the layers of skin. So why do patients with scleroderma get such bad nodes and get digital ulcers? So I'm going to try and explain that to you in the next several slides. So this is um, a little cartoon of a synthetic nerve um, next to a blood vessel. So in normal people, what happens when you're exposed to the cold is your body uh, cools off and you release this substance from the synthetic nerve called norepinephrine. Norepinephrine then um, joins with its receptors 
called alpha 2 C receptors on these smooth muscle cells. And that leads to vasoconstriction or, or closing of the blood vessels. Other things that happen also are um, here at the endothelial cell level. So nitric oxide is something that actually relaxes the smooth muscles and opens up, opens up blood vessels. Um, but when you're cold, the nitric oxide goes down. So what happens in systemic sclerosis or scleroderma? So you can see that there's an upregulation or an increased number of these alpha 2 C receptors. There's also increased release of norepinephrine and the joining with all these receptors causing an exaggerated vasoconstriction of uh, the blood vessels or closing of the blood vessels. At the same time, there's an increase of this substance called endothelin-1, um, which is a very strong vasoconstrictor as well, that's released from the endothelial cells and uh, decreased nitric oxide. So, so all of these things are at play, leading to a very exaggerated form of radiance phenomena in square patients. Now, in addition to having this abnormal sympathetic nerve response, Patients with scleroderma have underlying poor blood flow related to damaged blood vessels. So this is uh, called a thermography test. Um, so areas that are blue are low in temperature and show decreased blood flow. And so you can see here in this left hand that there's essentially no blood flow to the fingers. And this is what a cross-section looks like of a digital artery in patients with scleroderma. So what we're looking at, what we're looking for, is um, the blue staining, which stains for scar tissue. So we know that scleroderma is related to fibrosis or scar tissue throughout the body, and the digital arteries are one of the major areas that are affected. So what you can see is, in case of the entire digital artery is um, scar tissue, and then even in uh, the center part, we should have one single layer of cells called endothelium. But instead, it's replaced by a bunch of scar tissue here in scleroderma patients. And thus, this decreases the opening of the blood vessel or the lumen of the blood vessel. So you can see why there's decreased blood flow to the fibers. This uh, shows an arteriogram. Um, basically, dye is, is put into the blood vessels to, to light them up and to see where um, blood vessels are um, resulting in poor blood flow. So you can see here in the palm of the hand, the blood flow is still pretty good, but as you go distally to the fingertips, there's a sharp cutoff of blood flow to the fingers. And this can lead to problems like the green finger. So this poor patient had multiple fingers affected with gangrene due to decreased blood flow, and even had a prior event uh, years ago leading to amputation of the fingertip. So in summary, um, this kind of describes how um, patients develop bad digital ulcers in scleroderma. So first, there's some sort of environmental trigger that activates the immune system, and um, antibodies are produced, inflammation occurs, and the endothelium or the blood vessels are injured. And this leads to capillary destruction and platelet activation, so there's little blood clots that form in the blood vessels. And it also leads to uh, dysregulation of those hormones that I talked about, the endothelium one hormone, nitric oxide. So typically, the endothelium one goes up with vasoconstriction, nitric oxide goes down, and prostaglandins are another substance or hormone that, that leads to opening up of the blood vessels, but in scleroderma is often decreased and leads to this problem with scarring in the blood vessel, luminal narrowing of decreased uh, size of the opening of the blood vessel, and ultimately decreased blood flow to the tissues and uh, tissue injury or death. So how do we manage uh, Raynaud's phenomenon in scleroderma patients? Uh, first of all, you know, you want to avoid the trigger, so as much as you can, avoid cold and stress. Not so easy, but um, one thing I do want to emphasize is um, you want to make sure that not only your extremities are warm, but also your core body. So you know, wearing hats very helpful. Keep, keeping lots of layers and keeping your core body temperature warm is very important. Um, of course, smoking uh, we discourage, and any other uh, form of nicotine. Trauma also, if you can avoid trauma, you will avoid. Um, 
the risk of getting digital ulcers. Good skin care, the drier your skin is, the more likely you'll, you'll have uh, trauma and ability in the, the skin. And avoiding medications that can vasoconstrict the blood vessels. So here's a list of the common medications that can worsen right now. Um, you know, typically we're not too worried about our patients taking cocaine and amphetamines, but never know. Um, but common medications like decongestants and beta blockers, um, you should make sure that you discuss with your doctors whether you should take these medicines. Um, so, in terms of other treatment for digital ulcers, um, we definitely wanted to treat them supportively. So infections are really common. Um, staph infections are the most common. Uh, strep and other gut bacteria are also common in causing infections with digital ulcers. So Keflex is probably um, the antibiotic that we go to initially. Um, Clindamycin might be used, especially if there's a resistant form of staph. Um, Bactrim is also helpful, especially if you notice a lot of drainage, cardiac drainage. Pain medications definitely very important. We completely recognize that these are extremely painful, uh, these ulcers. And then uh, wound care, obviously, is very important. Things that you can do at home is just cleaning wounds with soap and water at least a couple of times a day. Using topical antibiotics can be helpful. And using um, hydrocolloid dressing um, can be helpful not only to uh, protect the skin from bacteria, but it actually serves as a barrier against further injury as well. This is what uh, Duoderm looks like. It's a form of hydrocolloid dressing that we often use to um, uh, treat wounds and help induce healing. Um, this just gives a description of, of how you use the, the dewormer. So you want to clean the area well, you want to make sure it's completely dry, and then you apply antibiotic ointment just to the wound site, um, and you cut the hydrocolloid dressing about a half inch to a full inch beyond the wound's margin, and place the hydrocolloid dressing over the wound. Um, and then it should be changed about every third day, or more frequently if it's using a lot. Now, sometimes on the fingertips, it's very hard for, for the duoderm to stick. Um, so you might need some assistance initially by a wound care nurse or, or clinic nurse um, to help show you the best way to place it. But it is tricky sometimes, and sometimes on those fingertips to keep the duoderm in place. So now I'm going to go through some medication options for treating radio phenomena and digital ulcers that we often use in the clinic. None of these agents are actually approved for the indication of uh, digital ulcers or ray nodes, but um, you'll see us using them a lot in the clinic. So a lot of these medicines are approved for other indications. Many of them are blood pressure medicines, and uh, some of them are used to treat pulmonary arterial hypertension. Calcium channel blockers are probably the first um, uh, drug that we've tried. Nifedipine is a very common one, and lodipine we also use very frequently. And um, it's a blood pressure medicine that opens up the blood vessels to improve blood flow. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors um, works by increasing that hormone nitric oxide to open up the blood vessels. And uh, the common medications we use are sildenafil or tadalafil. Um, these medications are also approved to treat uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, but they are very, very effective to treat brain and digital ulcers as well. Prostacyclins are drugs that are used in hypertension as well. They directly uh, open up blood vessels, and they also inhibit clot formation or phage aggregation. Uh, Ibuprostinol and Iloprost are the drugs that are most typically used, and Iloprost um, is approved in Europe uh, for the treatment of digital ulcers, but not uh, in the U.S. Topical nitrate um, or nitrate paste sometimes um, can be used. It often does lead to drop in blood pressure and headaches, um, so potential side effects. But it is also uh, working by releasing nitric oxide and opening up the blood vessels. Endothelin receptor antagonists block that, that powerful vasoconstrictor of endothelin 1. And these are also drugs approved for pulmonary artillery retention, both Santin and Ambrosentin and Macedonia. Statins are drugs that you're probably very familiar with to treat cholesterol. 
They work through a variety of mechanisms, though, that can be helpful for treating rainbows and digital ulcers as well. They actually increase the activity of those alpha 2 C receptors that I mentioned, um, so that um, there's actually, uh, I'm sorry, they decrease the activity of alpha 2 C receptors, so there's um, uh, vasodilation or opening up of the blood vessels. Angiotensin receptor blockers antagonize these receptors called um, angiotensin receptors that also cause vasoconstriction. So these are blood pressure medicines. Losartan is probably the most common one in product. Um, and they do lead to some efficacy in radios. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are medications approved to treat anxiety and depression. And we use them all the time to help with radios phenomenon. Um, it's not entirely clear how these work, but the thought is, is that they, they kind of break that conditioned reflex that when you're exposed to the cold or stress, that your blood vessels will spasm. So, uh, fluoxetine, surgically fluoxetine, we, we typically use um, uh, citalopram, which is very well tolerated. So, any one of these medicines is very effective. Uh, patients often feel a little strange to take a medicine for depression when they're not depressed. Um, but, you know, countless of our patients have benefited from these therapies, even if they don't suffer from depression or anxiety. So I encourage you to try this if you're having symptoms and you have low blood pressure, limiting your ability to take some of these other medicines. And then there are a few um, um, medications listed at the bottom that work by different mechanisms. So aspirin, clopidogrel, uh, um, these kind of break up the little blood clots in the blood vessels. Um, anticoagulation, not routinely used for, for rainbows or digital ulcers, but when there's uh, very severe digital ulcerations or ischemic um, events. Rocanase inhibitors are not approved at this point. There's very little evidence of their utility. And then um, other um, medications that are approved for pulmonary hypertension, like Riosuwa, also acts on uh, the nitric oxide pathway opening up the blood vessels. So here's a slide kind of just summarizing where some of these drugs work to um, help improve blood flow. So the calcium <coughs> blockers are shown here acting um, on the alpha 2 receptors. The ARBs are angiotensin receptor blockers affecting the angiotensin receptors. Um, the epithelin receptor antagonists blocking the epithelin statins working on the alpha 2 receptors as well as the epithelial cells. Um, prostaglandins and nitric oxygen side donors work here to affect the epithelium and increase the dilation. So, um, in addition to medical therapies for veins and digital ulcers, there are some procedures that can lead to uh, benefit and symptoms. So, Botox or botulinum toxin has gotten a lot of press over the past uh, several years now. I'll show you some of the, the literature behind whether Botox injections are helpful. It's thought that they inhibit the release of acetylcholine and norepinephrine from those sympathetic nerves. And this thus inhibits uh, smooth muscle cell and blood vessel constriction. It also inhibits the release of energy in the lung. Sympathectomy is um, either a chemical procedure or um, you can also have an actual surgery to help improve blood flow. And I'll talk briefly about uh, that procedure as well. So, um, Botox um, has been studied in multiple, multiple studies over the past 10 years or so. Um, this uh, study is a review of the literature looking at 10 of 29 studies conducted between 2004 and 2014 and included 129 patients with either primary or secondary radons. And um, as you can see, there are injections at around each of the neurovascular levels, about 10 units of botulinum um, toxin A is uh, injected in those areas. And 75 to 100% of these patients experience reduction in pain and healing of digital ulcers. The most common complication was having transient hand weakness, and that occurred in about 14% of these patients. There was a subsequent uh, systematic review of 11 studies that included 125 patients, again, with either primary or secondary renos. 
And um, these were all very small studies with no standardization in injection sites or their outcomes. And th there wasn't a lot of evidence supporting the efficacy in these studies. So basically, um, this systematic review concluded that we need large randomized controlled trials to figure out whether Botox is really effective. So um, last year, there was a publication of the largest randomized trial that we have thus far, done at Hopkins um, by Dr. Hammer's group. And this was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of 40 square number patients who received 50 units of Botox in one hand and then uh, saline injections in the opposite hand. So the same patients served as, as their own control. And um, at one month, Doppler laser imaging was done, and again at four months. And Doppler laser imaging allows you to see uh, blood flow to the fingers um, and determine the blood flow rate. There were also patient-reported um, outcomes of rate of severity at month one and month four. So here are the results, and they're kind of conflicting, um, which was a little bit disheartening, but. In the panel A, this uh, shows the blood perfusion uh, measured by Doppler laser imaging. And the, in red is the Botox group. <laughs> and you can see that at one month, there was actually decreased blood flow in the Botox group compared to the placebo group. And by four months, there was no difference at all. But there was actually a significant decrease in the Botox group compared to the placebo group at one month, which was a little bit confusing. Um, however, if you look at panel B, this is the Radon's Condition Score, which is a patient-reported uh, Radon's Severity Scale. And you can see that in the Botox, in the red group, there was a, a faster decline in Radon's Severity rated by the patient than in the, the, the group that's treated with placebo. So the laser doctor imaging kind of conflicted with the way the patients rated their score. So I think that there's still more research that needs to be done and maybe a larger study to look at Botox use in uh, radio and So finally, just wanted to touch on uh, sympathectomy. Um, so there are various forms of performing sympathectomy. You can have a chemical form where there's an injection of lidocaine or bupivacaine in the digital or wrist area. This just temporarily reduces vasoconstriction. Um, so this is done when there's what we call critical digital ischemia, so acute um, lack of blood flow to the fingers. And this can be done in the hospital setting. Cervical sympathectomies are a procedure that uh, decreases the activity of the sympathetic nerves. So that's where the abnormality is in brain nodes phenomena. And those nerves are, are stripped away. Um, and it seems to be effective, especially in patients with primary brain nodes phenomena, but there's only a lasting benefit in about 20% of patients. There's also risk for nerve damage, which can lead to uh, subsequent pain and loss of localized spreading in the area. So cervical sympathetomies have kind of lost favor due to their lack of uh, sustained relief and due to the uh, potential complications. So um, at Stanford, we do a lot of uh, digital sympathectomies. And this is a procedure, a surgical procedure, where the cancer can actually remove the sympathetic nerves and scar tissue around the blood vessels. And this allows them to expand and open up and improve blood flow. Um, especially useful for severe digital ulcers with any one or two fingers that you can do a digital sympathetic on just a couple of fingers. Um, and definitely we found that the earlier you intervene, the better the outcome is because there's less scar tissue uh, that is built up. Vascular reconstruction is when um, you perform a surgery to actually remove blocked areas of digital arteries and you actually um, have to find arteries that are open enough and reconstruct that area. So it's especially useful if a major hand artery is blocked. So this is just a study that uh, we did at Stanford just describing our early experience. Since, since we published this a few years ago, we've probably um, done some effectiveness on at least twice as many patients. But this was um, a study of 17 square number of patients, 26 hands, and digital sympathetic was performed between 2003 and 2013. 
And we found that 92% of the hands had pain improvement and uh, a complete resolution of pain postoperatively. Digital ulcers healed in all patients, and only in two patients was there a recurrence of digital ulcers that required repeat surgical intervention. So there were some side effects. Uh, minor infections, wound opening, or abscesses occurred in seven hands, but they were all treated as outpatients without severe complications. So finally, I just wanted to summarize a few um, algorithms that uh, people groups have created in how we manage Raymond's phenomenon and digital ulcers and sclerotoma patients. So this is from the UK Sclerotoma Study Group uh, from Crystal Tins Group. And um, this first slide describes an algorithm for how we manage Raymond's phenomenon. So uh, first of all, you want to establish the diagnosis as we reviewed at the beginning of the talk. Um, and you want to make sure that there's no underlying cause that's amenable to other treatments. Um, general lifestyle measures, obviously avoiding cold, keeping warm, stopping smoking. And then if that's ineffective, then drug therapy might be necessary. So you could use any one of the drugs that we discussed, calcium channel blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers, selective serotonin you have taken inhibitors, etc. You may need to add antiplatelet therapy or statin therapy if, if you still have a lot of attacks despite uh, one drug. Um, and if really refractory, um, in the UK, you can also get IV plastinoid or IV iroplasts for various severe components of um, Finally, they suggest that even if the IV plastinoid is ineffective, you can add a phosphodiesterase and liver. If all of that is ineffective, they suggest moving on to uh, the second algorithm, which is management of digital ulcers. So again, um, you want to treat any underlying causes, any infections that are complicating wound care and pain management, extremely important. Um, you want to optimize oral um, medications that open up the blood vessels. Or you could use ibuprostenoids, again, it's approved in the UK for digital ulcer management. You want to make sure that surgical de debris is done of any necrotic or dead tissue. Um, or of any underlying calcinosis that might be leading to, to ulceration. And you can add platelet, antiplatelet therapy or statins on top of that as well. If this is ineffective or there's recurrent ulceration, then you can repeat the IV, iroplasts with, with other uh, medicines to open up the blood vessels. And if that's ineffective, then they suggest digital sympathetic. Um, I would argue um, with our experience that digital sympathetomy may be considered higher up here even before there's recurrent ulceration in order to improve the likelihood of good outcomes. So finally, critical digital ischemia, that's when a patient comes in with acute uh, lack of blood flow to the fingers um, and then progressive uh, pain with the dying tissue. So um, again, you want to look for any other contributory causes. Um, patients are typically admitted to the hospital for IV iloplast and pain control, or IV constantly therapy. Antiplatelet therapy can be added, statins, and of course, re treating any infections. And if it's effective, you usually can uh, release a patient from the hospital on these oral vasodilator uh, therapies, typically like sildenafil, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. If it's ineffective, then you might consider again digital sympathectomy um, and uh, treatment, surgical debridement, as well as anticoagulation. So that's uh, the UK's algorithm. I just wanted to also briefly show you the Johns Hopkins algorithm, which is um, developed obviously in the United States where we don't have um, approved access to the IV costinoids, but um, still included in the algorithm for severe cases. So um, they break up patients into those with gray nodes with no digital ulcers present and those with uh, digital ulcers present. So in this first group, if you never had digital ulcers and you just have mild symptoms, um, then you could actually just monitor the patients and consider use of calcium channel blockers. If you've had prior ulcers, you probably want to treat them um, more aggressively. So they probably have moderate to, to severe symptoms. 
And um, you should consider using calcium channel blockers. It might even consider using phosphodiesterase inhibitors, or if uh, very severe, using IV prostaglandins um, if, if the blood pressure allows. Um, so the Hopkins group includes uh, Botox as a potential statin and the feeling receptor antagonist, as well as antiplatelet therapy for these patients with very severe controls or uh, uh, radiant phenomena. Um, so for those having digital ulcers present, but no critical ischemia, um, we still treat these patients very aggressively, and ibuprostenoids are, are recommended uh, in type of therapy, <coughs> again, treating super infections as well. And for those with evidence of critical ischemia, admitting to the hospital, uh, pain control, keeping the patient warm, and using IV prostenoids. So this is a, my final slide, actually. Um, and I just wanted to list here all of these medicines that are currently being evaluated for treatment of brain nodes and digital ulcers of patients with sclerosis. So a lot of them are uh, treatments that we use to treat pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the IV IVPress has improved in the UK and Europe um, and is actually being tested in clinical trials in the US right now. So just to summarize, um, brain nodes and digital ulcers and scleroderma are related to abnormal blood flow uh, from dysregulated signaling in the sympathetic nerves, as well as underlying uh, vascular disease. Medications for brain nodes and digital ul ulcers with randomized controlled trial evidence to support their use include calcium channel blockers, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, endothelium receptor antagonists, IV prostacyclines, statins, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and antidepressant receptor blockers. So we already have a whole armamentary of um, medications that we can use to treat brain nodes and digital ulcers. Right now, there's not enough evidence to support the use of Botox in the treatment of brain nodes and digital ulcers for further research to be done. But digital sympathetomy is definitely an important modality to improve blood flow. And finally, several novel therapies and procedures are currently being evaluated in randomized control trials. So hopefully we'll have even more um, potential therapies to help uh, patients with brain and digital ulcers. I just want to thank my collaborators at Stanford and I'm happy to take a question.